In chapter 4, we put supply and demand together to, dis to look at how the two forces interact to determine market prices. So we're going to start with situations where we have a shortage. So suppose that at the current price, quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supply. This would mean simply that buyers want more of the good than there is goods actually available to be purchased. So we call this a shortage, or some textbooks refer to it as excess demand. I like the term shortage better because it seems a little bit clearer and more straightforward. When we have a shortage, that's going to cause prices to rise. Sellers are going to realize that they're selling everything that they have, and there's still people that are trying to buy the product. So if they increase the price, they'll still be able to find enough customers. So as the price goes up, what happens? Well, we, in, as the price goes up, we move along the demand curve, and we see that the quantity demanded is decreasing. And simultaneously, we're moving along the supply curve, and with the higher price, quantity supplied is increasing. So the two are becoming more equal, and as a result, the shortage is getting smaller. So if we look at this graphically, here we have a price that's below the equilibrium. Uh, the equilibrium, by the way, is going to be right here, but that's jumping ahead a little bit. So at this price, the demand curve says this is how much consumers would like to buy. The supply curve says this is how much sellers are willing to offer for sale. My little supply got kind of messed up here on my graph for some reason, but that's supposed to mean quantity supplied. And the distance between the two here would be how big our shortage currently is, the difference between quantity demanded and quantity supplied in this case. So with the shortage in place, that's going to put upward pressure on the price. And so as the price starts going up, we're going to see that moving along the demand curve, our quantity demanded is going down. But as the price goes up, our quantity supply is getting larger, and the resulting shortage is getting smaller. And so this continues until the price gets pushed up to the point where the shortage is completely eliminated. Opposite situation is when we have a surplus. So suppose that we have a price where the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied. That simply means that buyers are not willing to buy as much of the good than what is actually available. We call this a surplus, or some textbooks refer to it as excess supply. I like the term surplus better. And if we have a surplus, you know, our sellers have items on the shelves that nobody's willing to buy, and so they start marking the price down, and we start to see prices. So, as the price falls, what happens? Well, we move along the demand curve. At a lower price, we're willing to buy more product, and we see that quantity demanded is increasing. And at the lower price, sellers are not receiving as much profit per unit, and so we see quantity supply decrease moving along the supply curve. And, and so the surplus starts becoming smaller and smaller. So if we look at this graphically, if we have a price up here, at this price, that says that based on the supply curve, here's how much good is being offered for sale or a quantity supplied. But at this price, consumers are only willing to buy this lower quantity demanded. So the difference between quantity supplied and quantity demanded at that price would give us the size of the surplus. So with the surplus in place, the price starts to go down as sellers reduce the price to try to get rid of the product. And as they do so, we move along the supply curve and we see that at the lower price the quantity supplied is reduced and at the lower price consumers are willing to buy more of the product now and the quantity demanded starts growing and the size of the surplus is getting smaller and so the price continues to drop until we hit this intersection where the surplus is completely eliminated so when we talk about equilibrium equilibrium is described as a situation where at the current price quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied buyers are willing to purchase exactly what the sellers sellers are willing to offer for sale so everybody gets to go home happy the reason we call this equilibrium is because the price here is stable and is not expected to change Equ so that describes the equilibrium price, the price for quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied, and the resulting quantity that's being traded. The term equilibrium simply means we have a stable outcome or a non-changing outcome. So on our graph, um, we look at the, the supply and demand relationships, and where the two curves intersect, 
That's where we find the price where quantity demanded and quantity supplied are exactly the same. So that determines the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. And once price is adjusted to equilibrium, we have no reason for price to change any further and we get a nice stable result. So what is so special about equilibrium? Well, all it is is it really is just giving us this nice stable outcome, but in the real world, these shift factors keep moving. So our supply and demand curves keep shifting around, which means that equilibrium is really a moving target. So in the real world, this model may not give us a good description of the actual prices and quantities that we see at any point in time, but it does give us something useful in terms of telling us what direction the market is moving in. If we see that we current have, currently have shortages, we know that the price is going to be rising. If we see that we currently have surpluses, we can infer that the price is going to be falling. Another nice thing about equilibrium, which we'll talk about in a moment, is that it gives us the maximum gains from trade or the most mutually beneficial exchanges. So in t this idea of gains from trade, if we have a price that's not in equilibrium, so first off, suppose the price is down here, and so we end up with this shortage, shortage of the good, which would naturally push the price up. If the price is below the equilibrium, a lower quantity is actually going to be traded. This is how many goods would be traded. The rest of these consumers go home without being able to purchase the good because of the shortage. And so with that reduced amount of uh, trading taking place, we have a much smaller producer surplus, and we have a funny-shaped kind of produce consumer surplus up here. Similarly, if we think about a price that's above equilibrium, so a price that's up here, at that price we see that there's a pretty sizable surplus, greater quantity supplied than we have quantity demanded, and this is the quantity again that gets traded. This is how many people are willing to buy the product, the rest of this is surplus that just sits on the shelves and nobody's purchasing. So here we would get a relatively small consumer surplus area, and we get this big funny shaped producer surplus area. If we compare that to the equilibrium though, at the equilibrium we would have bigger triangles for both consumers and producer surplus. So the combined surplus would be larger. Another way that we can think about this, if we focus on this quantity that I have labeled here, um, at this quantity, we have a buyer that's willing to pay at most this price to buy the product, and we have a seller that is willing to accept any price higher than this level. And, and so the producer and consumer surplus, if they can find a price that they agree on, is going to total this big distance here. And so the goal of the market is to match up all of the buyers and sellers where we can find mutually beneficial exchanges. So. If our quantity is below the equilibrium quantity, either because the price is higher than equilibrium or because the price is below, lower than equilibrium, we get what our book calls unexploited gains from trade. And this is essentially potential combined consumer and producer surplus that doesn't exist because we're not trading up to the equilibrium quantity. Another way to think about the, this in terms of why we call it unexploited gains from trade is we have buyers and sellers that could be mutually beneficially exchanging, but they're not able to find each other for some reason, and so those gains from trade don't actually take place. So, now that we've described what equilibrium looks like, what happens when our supply and dem demand curves start shifting? So, if any of our shift factors of supply or demand change, that's going to cause a shift in one or both of the curves. When the curve shifts, that's going to define an entirely new equilibrium, a new equilibrium point that the market's going to move toward. Note that the supply and demand curves are going to shift in response to changes in their shift factors. The ex expectations are the only shift factor that shows up on both lists. It's both a shift factor on the demand side and a shift factor on the supply side. And for that reason, on the exam, I won't tend to ask you questions where you have to analyze changes in expectations because they're more complicated than our other shift factor changes. Also, I want to point out just to emphasize that the supply and demand curves do not shift in response to price changes. When the price changes, we simply move along the supply and demand curves. Finally, supply and demand do not shift in response to the other curve shifting. So, let's look at what happens if we have an increase in demand. 
So first off, we'd have to think about why is demand increasing. Perhaps there's an increase in the number of buyers in the pro of the product. Uh, perhaps there's an increase in income levels and this is a normal good. Or there's a decrease in income levels and this is an inferior good. Or it's simply becoming more popular. You know, we could go through all of our shift factors of demand and come up with explanations for why demand might be increasing. So if demand increases, the demand curve shifts to the right. And if the price doesn't change, now we've got a shortage of the product. And so because demand has increased, it creates this shortage, and that's going to put upward pressure on the price. So the price increases toward this new equilibrium. So we end up with an equilibrium price that's higher than where we started. And we end up with an equilibrium quantity that's also higher than where we started. So in this case, describing what's happened, we would say that demand has increased or shift to the right. The equilibrium price has, as a result, gone up, and the equilibrium quantity has also gone up. Now, let's look at what happens if we have a decrease in demand. So perhaps the good becomes less popular, or there's a uh, recession that causes consumer incomes to fall, and this is a normal good, uh, whatever the reasons might be. So with a decrease in demand, the demand curve is shifting to the left. And... If the price stayed the same, now we've got a surplus. And so that surplus puts downward pressure on the price. So the price starts falling until it reaches the new equilibrium point. And as the price falls, we move along both the supply and demand curves, moving to our new equilibrium quantity. So describing what has happened here, we would say that the demand curve has decreased or shifted to the left. As a result, that causes the equilibrium price to go down and it causes the equilibrium quantity to also go down. What about if we have an increase in supply? So uh, perhaps the inputs used to produce the product become cheaper and that causes supply to increase. So there's a new cost saving technology or perhaps just more firms enter the market causing an increase in supply. So an increase in supply, remember that supply is shifting to the right when it's increasing. So as the supply curve increases, that's going to create a surplus if the price doesn't change, and that surplus is going to put downward pressure on the price. So the price starts falling until it reaches the new equilibrium level, and we find a lower equilibrium price than where we started, and a higher equilibrium quantity than where we started. And this is where a lot of students start to get confused in terms of we only want to shift one curve if only one thing is changing. So a lot of times students look at this for the first time and say, well, I'm buying more things, doesn't that mean that the demand curve should go to the right somewhere? No, you're buying more things simply because the price has gone down and that's caused us to move along the demand curve. It does not create a new shift. Our final change that could happen, a decrease in supply. Uh, so perhaps our inputs of production become more costly or higher price, or perhaps we have firms leaving the market for some reason. And so if we have a decrease in supply, the supply curve is moving to the left. And if the price didn't change, now we have a shortage. And that shortage puts upward pressure on the price. So the price increases to the new equilibrium. And we see a, a resulting decrease in the quantity. So in describing this, we would say that the supply has decreased. As a result, the equilibrium price has gone up. And the equilibrium quantity has gone down. So those are the four basic shifts. If only one thing changes and it's not expectations, that's going to cause either the demand curve to increase or decrease, or it will cause the supply curve to increase or decrease. And so as you work through these problems, it's always a two-step process. Something changes, and we need to think first, which curve shifts and in which direction? And second, how does that change the equilibrium price and quantity? So we can also look at more complex shifts. So what if two things change at the same time and we see that supply and demand both increase. So perhaps the uh, inputs used to make the product become cheaper causing the supply curve to increase and at the same time um, there's an economic boom and consumer incomes are rising and this is a normal good causing demand to increase. So this can be complicated to look at both changes taking place at once and instead of trying to think about it all at once the better approach is to look at each change independently to start with. So first off, looking at the demand increase. If the demand curve increases or shifts to the right, 
we expect to see a higher equilibrium quantity and a higher equilibrium price. If that doesn't seem clear, back up a few slides to where we talked about this. And then we look at the equilibrium, what happens because of the supply increase. So the supply increase by itself is going to lead to a higher equilibrium quantity and a lower equilibrium price. So when we think about the two shifts taking place at the same time, we simply look for a consistency. So when the demand curve increases, that causes a higher equilibrium quantity. And when the supply curve increases, that also causes a higher equilibrium quantity. So when we look at the combined impact, Combined, the equilibrium quantity has to be going up because both of those shifts independently have the same effect of causing equilibrium quantity to rise. So their combined effect is that equilibrium quantity will rise. But when we look at the price, the demand increase is pushing the equilibrium price up, while the supply increase is pushing the equilibrium price down. So our price is getting pushed and pulled in two different directions, and without knowing more about which shift is larger, we simply can't say exactly what's happening to the equilibrium price. It could be going up, it could be going down, it could stay the same if the two just completely offset each other, but we don't know which one of those is the case. And so we would say in this case that the quantity definitely goes up, but the change in the price is ambiguous or can't be determined. <coughs> so that wraps up uh, chapter four, looking at supply and demand together. Uh, the final chapter we're going to look at in this unit would be chapter 5, looking at elasticities, and I would recommend doing that chapter on Wednesday.